Hi, welcome to this webinar on the IMS Security Framework. I'm Colin Smy, the IMS Chief Architect. So what is the Security Framework? Well, it's the first step by IMS to draw together a set of patterns that we've been using on security across many of our different specifications and various specifications have been using different security approaches. So what we wanted to do is bring all of those ideas together, establish a set of common patterns that the specifications could make use of. And that means when um, our members and the general adopters are using the specifications, it means they've got a common security approach irrespective of which specifications we're using. And that's gonna make it easier for people to adopt the specifications. It also means that we can create more robust security um, so, uh, solutions. So in this uh, short webinar, I'm going to go through three areas. Uh, the first is the details of the security framework itself, and it, it's been published for over a year now. Then we'll look at the implications uh, if you're adopting the security framework, because clearly there's an extra layer of implementation detail that needs to be taken into account, so we'll take you through those steps. And then the security framework is a live document. So it's going to keep evolving as we get more and more experience in the various problems that our vendors and suppliers are encountering out in the marketplace. Also, the security solutions themselves evolve all the time. And therefore, we're expecting this framework to evolve. And we've created a uh, IMS security committee. And they're going to take responsibility for ensuring that IMS is adopting these best practices from the security world. We in IMS, the core team, we're not experts in security. And it's one of those areas where you really do need to take the advice from experts to make sure that no embarrassing mistakes are made. I've been out with IMS for quite a long time. And one of my responsibilities is looking at how all the different specifications fit together. And you'll have no doubt encountered the phrase, the IMS ecosystem uh, for a for like the last 18 months and clearly the security framework is an important component in the IMS ecosystem. So my responsibility is as well as actually helping author the security framework document is also ensuring that the framework is suitable for the different aspects of the IMS ecosystem and that our various specification activities are making the best adoption of the various patterns that are going to be available in the ecosystem. So what I'm going to do now is, is take you through what the actual uh, framework document is. A, a framework document within IMS establishes a set of patterns in a particular topic area. The security framework document is our first framework document, but we've got two others underway. One is to do with the extensions mechanisms that we're using across the IMS specs. And we've got a new one coming out addressing a common set of patterns for supporting JSON APIs. So framework documents establish common patterns to be adopted appropriately by the different specifications. We're currently at uh, version 1.0 but we've actually started work on a revision of 1.1, which we hope to publish in the next few months. So I'll take, take you through the changes that we've been identified. And those changes are driven by a set of new uh, needs, by some new specifications that we're adopting. And so keep in mind that the document is, is li a live document in that we're going to update it when appropriate. And we're not looking at a particular revision cycle. So we've not got in mind that we revise it every 12 months. We're going to revise it as and when a specific need is identified. So what's the objectives of the security framework? Well, first one is to set a set of best practices, okay, that we're going to make use of across the different standards. And what we're not doing here is imposing a particular aspect of a security solution. What we've done is identify a well-established, uh, proven set of solutions and saying to the specification developers within IMS, look, there's a set of patterns that IMS agrees to support. You as the working group identify the pattern that best suited to your specification development. So we're not saying every specification uses the same security approach at every level of detail. And the reason for that is because we've identified three different core use cases more a bit later on. And those three core use cases 
imply different solutions based upon a common approach. So we're giving the specification developers a lot of flexibility, but within a common pattern. And that common pattern is making use of uh, standards and specifications developed by other communities. So we're adopting the best practice that's out there, i.e. it's adoption and not creation by AMS. Now what we have done is we've not just taken a third party specification and adopted it lock, stock and barrel. What we've done is modify it and made it a little bit more better suited to the specific environments in which we operate. So we're trying to create as robust a security capability in our ed tech interoperability. And final point is that this is the 1.0 was the base specification. It's evolving and say that's going to reflect the difference of uh, opinions about the best approaches and patterns to use in the security world. As we know, there's uh, it's an evolving um, problem space, the security solutions that are under continual threat. And clearly education uh, technologies are particularly vulnerable given that we can have some very, very important information about vulnerable parts of society. Therefore, there's a great deal of responsibility in, in vendors and suppliers when they create ed tech solutions to make sure they're as robust as possible. But we've also got to keep in mind is that no solution is perfect. And it's merely a matter of time, really, before any solution, uh, there are detected vulnerabilities. And therefore, the IMS responsibility is to react as soon as possible to any detected vulnerability and to make sure that we update the framework and the associated specifications to remove that vulnerability. So what are the three scenarios that within IMS that we've currently identified? Uh, and there may be more new scenarios coming out. Certainly the uh, third scenario on here was added in the last 12 months. So the first one is the classic problem in that you've got um, typically uh, two systems that are trusted relationship with each other. Think in terms of a learning management system communicating with a student information system. Both systems have got a, an established trust relationship. They may very well be on the same university campus. They may be uh, communicating, say, in the K-12 marketplace between a district and a school. But there's an established relationship between the two. And therefore, we've got uh, a slightly uh, simplified problem in terms of doing a, a secure exchange there. An example, by the way, from an IMS point of view, is the use of the one roster specification, which is used for rostering of student information. And so that's a classic exchange of data, traditionally either between an uh, SIS, student information system, or an LMS, learning management system, or between a, a learning management system and, a, and a tool. So that's a, a very important scenario. And most of our specifications fall within that first category. Second category though, and this is particularly important to us because of our specification called LTI Advantage, which has a very, very well established deployment now, is the fact that you've got a browser directed experience from the user. And the user wants to be launched into a learning experience. And from an LTI point of view, that is termed as an example would be your working within a browser, interacting the learning management system, and you want to transfer the user from the learning management system into some third party application, a tool, a learning application. Therefore, you've got to be launched into that application. And therefore, there's a very, very different form of security problem going on there because you've got many, many third party applications interacting with an, a learning management system. The third party applications may be hosted by a separate vendor and that application may be being used by many, many different institutions. You've got potentially a very wide range of users and therefore you've got to authenticate the user in the context of the actual tool. And therefore that's a very different form of um, problem from the classic consumer provider. And then in the last 12 months, what we've identified is a, a third scenario, which is where you've got the big uh, institutional systems, but there is no established trust relationship. And so there, you've actually got to have two ends authenticate with respect to each other. A classic scenario here would be, say, I've got um, a an e-transcript comprehensive learner record that's being hosted by uh, an institution. 
I've got an app or another institutional system and it wants to gain access to a, a transcript, comprehensive learning record that's owned by an individual. So it may be being hosted by the institution, but the institution actually has no control over that. And therefore, the systems are going to authenticate that the user who's making use of third party app or system coming into the institutional system is who they say they are. So that uh, means that we need a third approach. And these are all based upon a common set of standards, as it turns out. And that standard comes from the uh, IETF, and it's the OAuth 2 standard. That's defined, is listed up here with the request for comments 6749, 6750, and 7591. So we've taken what is considered best practice in the community, and based upon our use cases, uh, tweaked the use of OAuth 2 to fit those. And as it turns out, use of OAuth 2 is particularly suitable for the web service relationship where there's no established trust relationship and where there is an established trust relationship. In the scenario where we've got, say, use encountered by our LTI advantage, that's where we need to look at another um, specification developed by the OpenID uh, Foundation, and that's called the OpenID Connect Core. As it turns out, that builds upon the OAuth 2. So OAuth 2 is a common framework standard that we've adopted. We've done a little bit of manipulation and adaptation to fit our needs. And then on top of that, we've built our OpenID Connect Core, and we've done some tweaks to that, because you've got to remember, as in the case with IMS specifications, all of these specifications have a large number of optional features. And what we try to do is remove a lot of uncertainty in the use of those optional features. And we've made as many of those required features as possible, or made it very, very clear the functional requirements that should be supported by the particular use of an optional capability. A further uh, refinement on the work is that we're making use of JSON web tokens. Uh, colloquially, though, those are known as JOTs, and they provide an extra layer of information exchange based upon uh, the use of OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect course. There's a further uh, set of um, RFCs that we've made use of. And again, the JOT tokens are used particularly in the LTI Advantage uh, scenario, but actually they're not just uh, restricted to that. So let's look at the details now of each of the three scenarios. So the first one is going to be the system where we've got two communicating systems that have an established trust. And on the left-hand side here, you can see the basic architecture. Now, on the left-hand side, we're using the terminology of consumer. In the OAuth 2 terminology, that would actually be called a client. But for internal reasons, we're using the word consumer in this particular context. So the consumer is the system that's going to consume the information from the service provider. So the consumer system wants to obtain information from the service provider. And before it can do that, the consumer must get an authorization access token from the authorization server, which basically gives it the authorization to actually acquire the information from the service provider. So as opposed to a normal API exchange where the consumer would just access the API from the service provider there's the primary step first of all of acquiring the access token as it's called. So on the right hand side we can start to see the choreography that takes place for the message transfer. So the first thing the, the client in OAuth 2 terminology has got to do is he's got to send an authentication uh, request to the authorization server. Now the authorization server may be a separate system from the actual service provider in this terminology here in the OAuth 2 is called a resource server. We also would call it a platform uh, in terms of the, the LTI scenario, uh, scenario, for example. So the authorization server is responsible for providing an access token. It's the authorization server's responsibility to generate the appropriate access token and also to interact with this resource server when the resource server wishes to confirm that the access token that's being supplied to it as part of the data request is, is valid. So the client issues an authentication request to the authorization server. The authorization server confirms that the client has the right credentials to access that token. 
and in the uh, security framework we define how that uh, those sets of credentials are exchanged or pre-provided but there's going to be some out-of-band administration system in general that supplies those access tokens to the client in our 1.1 security framework we've actually started to use another set of rfcs to actually automate part of that um, credentials of obtaining so the access token is supplied by the authorization server and that access token typically has a lifetime of about an hour the reason for that is that the same access token can be used on many requests to the service provider to obtain a variety of different resources so it's not a matter of requesting an access token per request you get an access token for a certain period of time it's entirely up to the uh, authorization server the duration of that access token so when you make the request as part of the response not only do you get the access token but you also get the expiry period if and when the token expires you have to get hold of a new token in a further revision of our security framework we provided a mechanism by which you can actually refresh the token when the security framework 1.0 once the token is expired you have to obtain a new token and carry on the process such so the reason why it's recommended to say for about an hour is that's uh, sufficiently long for a lot of interactions to take place but also provides sufficient robustness such that the token cannot be just reused because should it be captured by a third party then it could be used to obtain information correctly so there's a, an added layer of, of uh, robustness there so you've got the access token that access token has to be passed in every single one of the service requests to the resource server so the access token is validated and therefore there has to be some interaction between the resource server and the authorization server that form of interaction is not described in the security framework is out of scope it's a purely implementation dependent uh, process um, because the authorization server say could be integrated to the resource server or it could be an independent third-party resource server and therefore the you would use the third party's API for access to the authorization server. So we don't cover that part in the specification. One thing that's not covered in the OR2 specification is how you obtain the URL for the authorization server. Again, that's a feature we start to take a look at in the later versions. Um, and that what we're trying to do is establish a common pattern or set of patterns again by which you can obtain the URL and the final point to note here is that all of this exchange it's a, important that the data exchange mechanism itself is secured and for that we make use of the uh, transport layer security standard versions 1.2 slash 1.3 um, based upon the rfc 5246 so that provides the very low level uh, encryption of the information and it helps prevent things like man in the middle interactions taking place so let's look now at the scenario where there is no established trust relationship so you've still got the same basic architectural approach i've got the consumer wants to obtain information from the service provider but this consumer is in principle unknown to the service provider it's not part of the trusted network the the trust framework established so what then has to happen is on the the, sec, the right hand side there we've got a modified set of flows and that modified set of flow is shown by the top aspect here that's different and the underlying principle here is to obtain an authorization code which you can then make use of as part of the authorization grant request so in other words as a pre-authentication process taking place here whereby the client uh, issues an authorization request to the authorization server the authorization server effectively requests um, some form of authentication from the user so this will be uh, implemented something like a browser interface between the systems We're basically asking for an input authentication code when that authorized auth authentication code is inserted into the authorization server the authorization can confirms that it's valid and therefore supplies to the client the authorization 
uh, code grant, the authorization grant code. That grant code must be supplied as part of the authorization grant request that then goes to the authorization server. So if you remember from the previous approach, because the, the original um, and the client credentials approach, the trust relationship does not require this authorization code grant. In this step here, the authorization code grant is effectively being used to confirm that the user invoking access via the client is who they say they are. And once that code grant has been received, the appropriate access credentials, the access token is now supplied back to the client and therefore the client can use that access token to request the resources. So there's quite a lot of extra choreography taking place in that first step to authorize the access capabilities of the resource owner. That's why it's particularly important in scenarios such as our comprehensive learner record where the record itself is owned by the, 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 the learner, the individual, as it's being stored on a third party system and the access mechanism is taken, will vary depending upon the system the owner is making use of to get access to that information. And also that same approach can be used if the resource owner wants to give permission to a third party to acquire information about them. Now, let's look at the third scenario. This is one where we've got the non-web services based approach. So the architecture on the left hand side shows now we've got the learner, the end user is working inside the platform. And the platform here is the LTI Advantage terminology we're using. And the user wants to make use of a learning application a tool. And therefore, without the authentication authorization, there will be an LTI launch that takes the user from the platform into the tool experience. And therefore, the, the user effectively is working through a browser interface inside of the tool. So the, the user experience is being transferred from the platform into the tool. Now, the point about this approach here is that we have to actually authenticate and authorize that exchange that transfer now has to take place. And again, uh, there's an extra step on top of the OF2, which is to actually authenticate the user themselves. And also with respect to the tool, it is not unusual for a third party organization to provide a tool to many, many different institutions. So there's the institutional learning management system or the institutional platform here, and then making use of third party tools, the platform has all of the information about the learner and which tools they're meant to have access to. The tool itself though wants to authenticate that that learner as they come in has the right access code to the actual tool itself which is over and above just the platform. And the reason for that is because the tool is going to support Generally speaking, the tool will provide information about the learner's activity and learning experience. So the tool has to understand, have some way of identifying an authenticated learner, user, such that it can provide that information, or use that information to provide information, tracking about the individual themselves. So that's why there's an extra step here going on because the in relationship between the platform and the tool is not just about the tool and platform relationship, it's also about the learner making use of the tool. So there's a far more complicated set of uh, protocol flows that got, that's got to take place here. And I'm not going to go into all of the details uh, about this because that's why we've written it all up in, in the security framework. But effectively, we're making use of public and private key encryption between the two ends. There's an out-of-band registration process by which the public keys for the, between the tool and the platform have to be established. And clearly, because it's public and private key, the two end systems themselves have, are responsible for generating their private key. So it's a combination of public private key exchange taking place here, followed by a further set of uh, identification information because of the many, many different ways in which a tool can be hosted, a platform will, will make use of that. So it leads into things like there are issuer IDs, uh, client IDs, and again, and this is why Scottish Framework has to pin down very, very specifically the nature of those IDs, the duration of those IDs, which of those are basically um, 
long term and can live outside of the relationship of the uh, mapping between the tool and the platform i.e there's one experience taking place the learner goes into the platform into the tool the public and private keys though can live have far longer duration those are not necessarily going to be pinned to the actual relationship between the learner the platform and the tool those public and private keys will have a relationship between the platform and the tool and of course at a further level of robustness robustness to this it is possible to have a uh, key set so there's a set of public and private keys and for the systems to agree to rotate through various sets of those keys again adding a further layer of complexity let's now look at the evolution of the security framework uh, we're working on version 1.1 and three of these four changes listed from here have been identified by the IMS specification working groups who've said they want new features added in, they want to make use of from a security perspective and therefore they want the IMS security framework to establish the agreed patterns and therefore they can cite the IMS security framework and make further revisions because even within the security framework document, we still define a variety of features optional is entirely acceptable for a specification to say in their particular context they will take an optional feature and make it mandatory again because they've got specific use cases that they need to address so the first requirement was the fact that it's useful to just refresh a token so in the authorization co-grant scenario and it's only in the authorization program that you can do token refresh. It's not supported by the client credentials. As opposed to minting a new access token, you can requ request that the current token is refreshed. So that's the first new feature. And we're making use of the, as it says up there, RFC 7009. Second, because of the nature of uh, the fact you've got third parties, there may be scenarios where you actually want to revoke a token. Uh, depending upon the duration and therefore we've added support in for token revocation again only available as part of the authorization co-grant aspect and that's again covered on the rfc 7009 a third area is starting to look at the problem to do with the fact that you want to be able to dynamically register a client that's in other words you want to provide them with the original credentials so they can obtain the access token. Now at the moment we've left that open, it's entirely, it's an out of band system. It would be far better if there was an automated system which you could do dynamic client registration. And therefore we've got again two subtly different approaches but they are perhaps based one upon the other. So we're looking at the use of the RFC 7591, 7592, which explains from the IETS, IETF's perspective about how you're gonna make use of dynamic client registration. And that's based upon the original approach defined by the OpenID Connect organization. So the LTI Advantage group is, again, because they're making use of OpenID Connect, it is quite natural for that solution, therefore, to make use of the OpenID Connect registration approach, whereas the uh, specifications that have been based upon the core or what are not using OpenID Connect, it is more natural for them to make use of the RFC 7591-7592 approach. But the two are actually totally compatible and consistent. So, and again, we're adopting well-established specifications out in the marketplace and adopting them for our usage. And as you would expect in any 1.0 specification, there's a number of areas of confusion. Um, which we've therefore made some editorial changes to add clarity to our approaches, made it clearer, clearer who should be using what parts of the specifications, and one or two um, errors have been corrected. And all of this information on those corrected errors and things are maintained, uh, documented in the framework document itself, but also available through our normal process development. So we've got a GitHub repo and more about that later on. So what does the changes to the architecture. So look on the left hand side there. Um, we've got the classic scenarios point, been using time and time again of the service provider. It's got the API labeled A and that's the actual API that's defined by an IMS service specification. And then the authorization server, you've now got 
effectively four APIs. <coughs> the um, I API, that's the current OAuth2 authorization endpoint for, for obtaining an access token. So that's the endpoint we've been talking about in the framework 1.0. Added to that now is the capability to do token refresh through that same IP API. And we've now added three new endpoints to support, as it's listed down here, uh, tyrant, uh, token revocation, the client registration endpoint. And because we've got client registration taking place, we want to be able to manage the set of clients that have been registered things like we might want to delete them, change registration, access codes, and all those sorts of things. And therefore, there's a, a further endpoint called a new client configuration. So this 1.1 security framework document addresses new endpoints J, K, and L. So let's now look at how to make use of the security framework and the implications when you're adopting from a point of view of developers having to create further solution points. And again, one of the objectives of the security framework is to minimize the amount of new development work. And therefore, once you've adopted one of the patterns for security and use another specification, which uses the same pattern, it's the same code base that can be adopted, which should certainly simplify the overall long-term maintenance. So first of all, you'll need to go down to this landing page is labeled on the right hand side there. It will bring you into this IMS security framework landing page, which sets the scene. One of the reasons it's important to set this um, bookmark, this endpoint, is that not only is this the entry into the security framework, it's also the point where we post security bulletin bulletin notifications because there's a variety of, of issues that take place an example would be is that in our earlier specification set we made use of OAuth 10a and over the last four years we've been transitioning from OAuth 1 over to OAuth 2 and therefore we've been slowly deprecating various aspects of the OAuth 1 and it's adopting various specifications so that we can migrate all of our specifications to the security framework and therefore it's on this uh, landing page here that we make all of the security bulletin notifications. And that's important because we are deprecating a quite, a, quite a few of our specification versions in light of the fact that they are using an old technology base. One example of that is that we've already fully deprecated use of uh, our one roster 1.0 specification because that only enabled use of OAuth 1.0a. And we've just announced that the timeline for the full deprecation of use of OAuth 1.0a in the one roster 1.1 specification. And what you're going to find is in the one roster 1.2 specification that's currently in a candidate final form is that is only going to make use of the OAuth 2. So the one roster 1.2 is fully aligned to the security framework. The OAuth uh, the one roster 1.1 specification has been aligned with security framework for the last 12 months but not all implementations are making use of the OAuth 2 capability. OAuth 2 was, was an option but within 12 months time all of the one roster 1.1 systems will be fully aligned to the IMS security framework and therefore will only make use of the OAuth 2. Apart from the IMS security framework, we also have a significant activity in privacy. And we can see on this page here, our privacy and security task force, where significant effort is invested in our app betting program. Here we've defined a rubric by which apps are evaluated and security and privacy is a key component of that evaluation. And on the IMS website, we have a register of all of the apps that have been through our vetting and privacy process. And that information is also going to be available through our product directory. Finally, if you go into the uh, landing page of the Security Framework, you'll get access to the IMS Security Framework document itself. This document it conforms to the IMS respec format. It's a HTML page which you can download. It's about a 60 page document. You'll see here this particular one, version 1.0 was published 
in May 2019. And you would expect to see and all of the IMS specifications as they uh, undergo development, they're going to make use of and cite the security framework and make use of the appropriate parts. So you'll see on the left hand side, there's two basic uh, sections that address. Section four is looking at securing of web services. So that addresses the client credentials uh, between trusted systems and the authorization code grant between untrusted systems. And then section five looks at message security and message signing adopted for uh, specifications such as the LTI advantage. So what specifications have we got released out in the world that's making use of these? Well, you can read the list as well as, as I can. Importantly, LTI Advantage, which was published at the same time as the security framework. In fact, one of the reasons why we had to delay the security framework publication was to get the LTI Advantage specification completed because the LTI Advantage work was proving that the um, non-web services approach was sound. So we've got there LTI Advantage uh, and the one roster 1.1 and one roster 1.2 are deployed now, making use of the OAuth 2. The, the case network that we provide, which is a service IMS provides on, makes use of the IMS competencies and academic standards exchange specification. The core specification there does not cite usage of the security framework, but in our case network, our service that we provide, we secure the APIs using our security framework. A comprehensive learner record specification, which is a new specification in Canada final. Uh, that work uh, was the, one of the primary drivers for the creation of the authorization code grant and the further work in support of the new token revocation and token refresh. And then again, notice the comprehensive learner record has got the non-trusted endpoint as well as the trusted endpoint. So you've got a specification there that depending upon the actual ways in which a user wants to access their information, they can make use of more than one security approach. Again, determined by the systems which they're making use of. Because remember the, the end user really does not ex experience directly the ways in which the security exchange mechanism is taking place. The, in the case of the non-trusted one, yes, there is a, an authentication step that they've got to pass some credentials over, but that would be like a secret password that they've already agreed with the end system. So you can see that we've got quite a few specifications or deployed using this approach, and all of the new specs underway are already aligned to the framework. So we're slowly starting to build up a significant amount of experience in the use of our framework ourselves. So what does it mean from a developer? Well, if you're a service provider, if you're somebody who's going to provide a service that provides the endpoints, which are going to be suppliers of the data to the consumers, you've got to provide all an OAuth 2 authorization server. That authorization server has to be capable of providing access tokens upon request. You need a mechanism by which you're going to provide the credentials. Uh, a further detail is the fact that the specifications define scopes. You have to manage the allocation of the scopes inside of the authorization server to make sure that not only when you request an access token that you've got the, you're going to give a particular scope over which of the endpoints you're allowed access to. And you've got to make sure there's a connection between the authorization server and the service provider capability itself. So if those are two separate systems, you need to make sure you've got those two working together. If you're an implementer of a client, okay, so then you've got to make sure you implement the process by which you request an access token for an authorization server. And therefore, you've got to provide a mechanism by which your system can have input into it the access credentials that are going to be used to validate the access request, the authorization server. You're also going to make sure that you've got some way in which you can allocate, provide to the client the URL for the authorization server. Uh, clearly, if this is a quite a, a large deployed system, then that's quite a straightforward process because this URL will be fixed. But if you've got a client that's going to make use of many authorization servers, you've got to provide a mechanism by which you can uh, provide the correct URL for the correct service that you want to gain access to. 
Thirdly, if you're looking at the LTI Advantage approach, then you've also got to take into account the fact that you've got to implement the OpenID Connect protocol, which includes usage of public private key uh, distribution. Um, also, depending upon the type of deployments that you're encountering, you may have to use more than one mechanism for the distribution of the public key. And there may also be restrictions on the nature of the way in which the private keys can be generated. So there's quite a lot of out of band work to be done, which is classic in a public private key scenario, but which provides a more robust secure infrastructure, which is really one of the core objectives for this whole approach. And again, we're there for many, many uh, code languages uh, and um, deployment environments, there are well-established programming libraries that you can make use of to implement these things. So it's very, very rare that you have to start from scratch on the implementation of libraries to make use of this. We've been very careful to make sure that not only are we using well-established uh, specification practices, but also that there's a lot of uh, developer tools, uh, code libraries out there that you can make use of and therefore it really reduces the effort in terms of development and implementation. Obviously within IMS uh, we need to make use of the security framework ourselves and one of our core provisions when we release an EdTech interoperability specification is that we provide certification of uh, vendor solutions to confirm that their implementation supports the specification correctly and therefore we also secure access to those um, that system itself and because we're testing a real implementation our test systems ha either have to operate as a uh, as a consumer to test a service provider or vice versa a service provider to test consumer so we have an IMS authorization server that's going to be used where if you're a consumer undergoing testing so if you're a one roster consumer uh, you have to make use of the IMS authorization server Clearly, it follows the IMS security framework process. In some cases on the specification, you will have to formally request access credential to gain access to a particular test system. As our test systems are only available to our IMS members, that's not a particularly difficult process. What we're going to look at now is the IMS security committee, and that's the set of people that are responsible for ensuring that the IMS working groups are making best use of the security framework and helping advise the IMS team on the new breaking issues to be, to be addressed with respect to security. One of the reasons why we need this committee is because it's a very, very specialized area and we want to draw upon the expertise from the IMS members and we've got members such as Google, Microsoft, Oracle, uh, all members of Blackboard in structure, content developers, Cengage, and you can imagine they've got a significant amount of experience. The IMS core team is a moderately sized group of uh, six individuals really, and therefore we don't have the in-house capability. But even if we did, it's always good to draw upon the expertise of our members. And therefore what the security committee does is bring together the appropriate skill set into one group The objectives of the security committee here are to take ownership of the security framework itself and they help us direct its development. Uh, so yes, the IMS working groups that are working on specifications identify pain points and particular functionality which they need to get through and create solutions which their marketplace demands. But what we want to do is make sure that whenever a solution is being considered for one of the working groups, it can be reused elsewhere within the IMS specification set as appropriate. So it's a security committee that makes sure that we look in the broader term whenever we address a particular solution. They provide us with state-of-the-art knowledge about best practices in the security world and therefore keep IMS uh, aware of what's developing uh, an example would that would be is we are aware that the OAuth 
RFC is under development currently and we have to take into account potential changes. We know that certain aspects of the OF2 framework have been removed by the new 2.1. It's an evolving specification. Unfortunately, thanks to the guidance of the security committee, we've been able to avoid uh, adopting uh, a feature that we know is about to be deprecated in OAuth. And that's a classic scenario where the security framework people provide us with that insight. A third activity is for this committee to take responsibility for the annual security assessment of the specification suite. So that's once a year, we're gonna do a in-depth review of the adoption of the security framework, the strengths and weaknesses of that adoption in the different uh, specifications. Uh, classic consideration is that it is not a requirement that a specification provides security. If the specific specification has identified the security is to be used, it is a requirement to make use of the security framework in most cases. But as with all our specification developments, there are some exceptions. And the point being is that the security assessment, the audit, will always review any attempt, any exceptions and do an analysis about whether or not that exception was appropriate. And if, if necessary, over a period of time to review any decision that's been made. Because again, because of the evolution of the security standards that are available, we ourselves have to take that into account. So whereas we may have some of its best practice this year, in a year's time, it may not be best practice. In the year after that, it, it, it may be very bad practice. So the audit is a way in which we can formally identify that. And this information is then formally reported to the IMS board and the IMS members so that they can have confidence that we're taking full due diligence and best practice in terms of awareness and usage of security. Currently, the committee's five to six people from our IMS members. We have a full cohort from the IMS core technical team as appropriate. Um, and the members commit about four hours a month per activity on, on this. We have two experts currently in the field of security and two experts in the field of EdTech in particular with uh, adoption of large, with the deployment of large systems. And we are anticipating rotating membership every two to three years, which we're in the, we're just coming up to the end of, of, of year one of that. Uh, we meet virtually once every month and we're planning to have a face-to-face -face once a year. So it's, it's a regularly meeting committee and uh, each committee meeting, we review any new issues being identified. Clearly an aspect of that is working through the 1.1 revisions and also some uh, forward gazing into issues uh, that IMS needs to be aware of that won't have any impact in the next 12 months, but may have be potential issues for us further afield. So we're hoping to get the security framework 1.1 issue between August and September this year. It's well underway. We've got a very detailed set of um, updates to the documents which we're currently reviewing. Um, we've started the audit with respect to compliance of the specification with respect to the framework. So that's planned for an audit report at the end of this calendar year. One thing is that we're always on the lookout for broader, richer membership. Uh, we think we may rotate two members in the next uh, six months. So as a member organization, if you have a particular expertise in security, uh, then please talk to us. It is important, by the way, you're a full IMS contributing member to participate in the security committee. So finally, please uh, feel free to contact myself, Colin Smythe, or Mark McKell. Mark is the technical program manager for the security uh, committee and the security framework documents. So please feel free to email either of us. You can get access to, if you're an IMS member, to the actual forums within IMS, so via that link there. And if you want to see the latest versions and updates of the security framework document, and to see the issues that have been raised by the IMS members, you'll need access to our GitHub repo, and there's the link for that. But you do need to have registered your GitHub handle with, with IMS beforehand together so that we can give you access to our security framework. Thank you.